Hi everyone and welcome to the program. First tonight, startling claims surrounding key forensic evidence in some of South Australia's most controversial and notorious murder investigations. Bungled evidence that just might have sent innocent people to jail while those that were actually guilty went free. It questioned the work of one man who for decades was primarily responsible for the bulk of the state's most sensitive and vital forensic investigations. Experts have contacted today tonight are firmly of the opinion Adelaide's former chief forensic pathologist, Dr Colin Mannock, got it wrong. Not a little, but a lot. Here's Rowan Wynn. Our system, um, instead of serving the public, has begun to serve itself and has become distanced from the public and their needs. And we need to correct that. When the justice system fails once or twice, you might call it a mistake. But I think it's tragic, I think it's absolutely dreadful. But if it chooses to ignore its failures year after year for decades, it can only be described as a disgrace. Most people um, look to the justice system as being there for them if things go wrong. The realisation that when things do go wrong, that the system isn't actually working properly, is, uh, is a dreadful prospect for the people who find themselves confronted with that, and they feel very let down. Case in point, Dr Colin Manick. Dr Manick was South Australia's chief forensic pathologist for three decades. The problem was, he was never properly qualified for the job. There's a strong body of evidence to show that uh, he is not guilty of the charge. We've already revealed how Manick's evidence in the trial of Henry Keogh has since been savaged by eminent and qualified forensic pathologists. If I were describing this evidence to the jury at, a, at the trial of Keogh, I would have said it was incompetent and unprofessional. And now we've uncovered a catalogue of bizarre findings stretching over 30 years. They go back as far as the controversial investigation into the drowning death of Dr George Duncan. It was thrown into the River Torrens, a well-known homosexual haunt, and drowned in May 19. According to Mannix expert evidence, Dr Duncan drowned quickly after falling in the Torrens River because he hit, quote, a rough surface knocking the wind out of him. I'm not familiar with the tidal patterns of the River Torrens, and maybe there are big waves that come up and down there, I don't know, but I think it unlikely. And uh, um, I can't imagine what a rough patch on the river um, would be like. Then there was the case of Fritz van Beelen, who was convicted for the murder and rape of 15-year-old Deborah Leach. Mannock's evidence effectively put van Beelen away for over 17 years. But the question remains, did police get the real killer? He, he served one of the longest sentences in uh, um, South Australia for a, in a murder case. Normally, he would have been allowed out on parole after about eight and a half or nine years. In fact, he served 17 and a half. The reason for that was that when he went to the parole board and asked to be allowed out on parole, they basically said to him, well, look, how do you feel about what you've done? And he'd say, well, I didn't do it. And they basically said, well, look, I think you're a very sick person and you should perhaps stay in here and have a little think about it. Dr Manick's evidence was extraordinary. First, he claimed he could accurately calculate the time of death from Deborah's stomach contents. Even now, people would say that it's not possible to do that. Well, if it's not possible to do it now, it certainly wasn't possible to do it then. Based on this dubious process, he claimed she died at 4.30 in the afternoon, a time when Van Beelen had been on the beach. The problem is, he forgot about the tides, a pretty standard occurrence at the seaside. He also seemed to ignore the fact that a radio was found right next to Deborah's body. When it was picked up, it, real, it was realised that it was still switched on, but that the batteries had run down. So they replaced the batteries, and the radio worked perfectly well. Manic overlooked the high tide which occurred between the time of death he set and the time the body was found. Both Deborah and the radio would have been underwater at some point during the night. If the radio had been there at that time, it would have been covered by about five feet of water. Um, one wouldn't have expected it to work particularly well the following morning. Then there was the case of lawyer Darren Stevenson, who was found dead in a freezer at his home on Greenhill Road. David Zack was charged with shooting Stevenson and putting him in a freezer. His body was uh, bent round into a sort of fetal position, and we know that his body had been in the freezer for some considerable period of time. 
Manik claimed he could work out how long the body had been in the freezer by using a special scientific formula. Again, the time of death was key, because the police needed to know whether Zach was at Stevenson's house around the time of the murder. Dr Manick thought that he could take the formula that was developed in those experiments and apply them in this particular case to try and estimate the time at which the murder had taken place. This was a complete misapplication of the science involved. The scientists who conducted the experiments were careful to point out that the theory only worked if the bodies were flat. But Stevenson's body was bent over, so Dr Manick took it upon himself to adjust the formula. He had to adjust the formula, as he said, by 40%, because the body had been bent round rather than being frozen in a sort of prone position. And where did he get the figure of 40%? He made it up. Despite that, David Zack was convicted of murder. Then there was the case of Mrs Emily Perry, who, thanks to Manick's evidence, was convicted of poisoning her own husband. But on appeal, Dr Manick's evidence was found to be fundamentally flawed. As it turned out, Mr Perry was suffering from the symptoms Manick claimed were signs of poisoning before he'd met his wife. She was convicted. Um, the matter was appealed to the Court of Appeal, and then it went up to the High Court of Australia. In the High Court, um, uh, Justice Murphy said that the forensic science in this case represented an appalling departure from accepted standards of forensic science. Um, and you have to say that that's no minor criticism. And the High Court went even further, slamming the state of forensic evidence in South Australia. In the High Court appeal, the Justice Murphy again said, um, if this is the quality of support that's available to the prosecution in this case, then it demands a very serious improvement. None of this is news to the current state government. It is fully aware of the concerns about Manic's evidence. But still, Premier Rand seems obsessed with the cost of a proper inquiry. I wouldn't think, however, a Royal Commission would be the way to go. A Royal Commission simply costs money. Do you think the government and the Premier are scared of what they might find if they do go looking? I think if I was in their situation, I would be. Um, the real fear on the part of the government is because they've fixed all their budgets up for the next year or two, um, and this sort of thing, which is unexpected, might upset the apple cart a bit. The real question now, how long will the people of South Australia keep participating in a system they don't really believe in? Ron Wen reporting.